Welcome everyone to the third panel of today's conference. Uh, it's called Resistant Solidarities and I'm really pleased to um, introduce to Danny Olver, Andita Pan, Debashrita Day with Priyanka Tripati and Abul Frushan with Ali Abdul Rezai. Um, it's going to be our sort of proper literature panel, which I think which is great. <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to it. And as in the previous panels, all four papers will be presented and then we'll have, you know, we'll open it up to questions. So if you have any questions, please put it in the chat or email us under psc uh, at uh, ntu.ac.uk, um, which is also, and the email address is also in the chat function. So without further ado, let's please welcome Danny Oliver, you know, who is one of our doctoral candidates and the, uh, the title of her paper is Indigenous Young Adult Literature in Solidarity with Cultural Activism. And I just want to give you a slightly longer introduction. <laughs> So Danny Louise Oliver is a Midlands Four Cities funded PhD student in the in English at Nottingham Trent University and member of the Postcolonial Studies Centre here. Her doctoral thesis investigates how contemporary indigenous authors deploy and subvert the conventions of young adult school stories to unmask and confront enduring colonial legacies in educational context and how indigenous youth activism is gaining ground in our contemporary in, in our contemporary moment. So thank you very much, Danny. Indigenous young adult literature in solidarity with cultural activism. Cynthia Lytic Smith's Hearts Unbroken. In 2014, the announcement of an all white all male panel of children's authors assembled for a book con event sparked the We Need Diverse Books hashtag. A grassroots movement and the creation of the We Need Diverse Books platform to advocate for essential changes in the publishing industry to ensure that representation reflects the lives of all young people. However, according to up-to-date statistics from the Cooperative Children's Book Centre, the CCBC, the percentage of literature for children and young adults that depicts protagonists from a diverse background is lower than the number of narratives that feature animals as main characters. This infographic, created in 2018 using the CCBC's data, illustrates this stark reality. The CCBC, based at the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, has been collecting and documenting books for children and young adults by and about Black, Indigenous and people of colour since 1994. According to data that was updated in October 2020, the centre received 4,035 books to assess in 2019, 46 of which were written by Indigenous authors and 65 by or about Indigenous people. That equates to a little more than 1% and includes books created by white or non-Indigenous authors and illustrators, among which there may be stereotypical or insensitive representations of Native peoples. Cynthia Lytic smith is a writer who intervenes in this context. She is a citizen of the Muscogee Cree Nation, celebrated as a diversity Jedi, and curator of Heart Drum, an imprint of HarperCollins for native creators. She is a winner of the American Indian Youth Literature Award and oversees the children and young adults literary platform, Sensations. She has an activist agenda that is tested and debated in the novel she writes. In her young adult novel, Hearts Unbroken, which I'll focus on today, she navigates issues of representation and how anti-native prejudice may be understood to operate in a school setting in the context of a classic children's story that is just celebrated its centenary, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Hearts Unbroken follows Louise Wolf, a citizen of the Muscogee Cree Nation, who describes herself as an urban, make that suburban Indian, for her senior year of high school. She is elected to work on the school's newspaper and the story of the year is the musical director's inclusive approach to cast in The Wizard of Oz. The decision to cast Chelsea Weber, an African-American girl, in the lead role of Dorothy, Junior A.J. Rodriguez, a Latino-American American, as the Scarecrow, and Louise's brother Huey as the Tin Man, ignites the wrath of a group of white parents who form Parents Against Revisionist Theatre, known as P.A.R.T. Tensions mount in the predominantly white middle-class area of East Hansburg, a Kansas town, when these parents send anonymous threatening letters to school children and their families, 
which expose and make clear long-held prejudices. They spread racist hostility against students, teachers, parents, and most specifically the cast members in the spotlight of the controversy, including Louise's brother, Huey. The first time that readers encountered the PART group is when an email is circulated objecting to the colorblind casting of a school musical as soon as it is announced and tries to encourage other parents to complain. The group's leader, a mother and church-going Christian, states that, Everybody knows fair and equal is code for lowering standards to give an unfair advantage to minorities. She adds that the school is trying to fix old discrimination with new discrimination instead of moving forward. It's a sad state of affairs when we're so politically correct that the truly talented kids are pushed aside. We simply cannot allow this reverse racism to take root. Smith immediately fosters in her young readers and understanding of the issues involved through the Kevlar Louise's mother, previously a teacher, now working to become a lawyer to defend Indigenous community. She takes the time to explain to Louise and Huey the difference between a colorblind approach that can lead to whitewashing, white actors in blackface, yellowface, redface, and a color conscious approach that means casting actors in roles where the race, ethnicity, and skin hue of the character doesn't matter to the story, and which opens up opportunities and pushes back against the white default. Pushing back against the white default is exactly what Hearts Unbroken does. For a young adult readers, Smith mounts a controversy to suggest an alternative to the monolithic representations of indigenous people, and points to other indigenous young adult authors working to do the same. Within the novel, we see Huey seek out a native young adult title for himself through Eric Gansworth's If I Ever Get Out of Here, a gift he receives from the school librarian. Louise similarly refers to a collection of titles by indigenous young adult author, Tim Tingle. In Hearts Unbroken, Smith lays school experiences that can lead to indigenous youth activism, including being subject to persuasive, insensitive representations of native identities in US culture, for how they intersect with teens on a day-to-day -day basis. Hearts Unbroken emphasizes the prevalence of Hollywood Indians for no apparent reason in school sports days, as well as professional sports via names of football teams like the Kansas Chiefs and the behavior of their frenzied fans in red face. This is also shown through national holidays and cultural events like the Turkey Trot Race. I should be able to skip along, singing a song, trying to survive high school without fakey feather-headed red faces swooping down like flying monkeys on national holidays and at ball games. Illustrating my point, the guy in the turkey costume jogged by, playfully chased by a guy in a pilgrim costume wielding a plastic butcher knife, who in turn was playfully chased by a guy in a Hollywood Indian costume wielding a plastic tomahawk. The novel also shows Louise's change in assertiveness and move towards activism. And it is the controversy surrounding The Wizard of Oz that drives Louise's journey towards personal growth. When the novel opens, she's feeling uneasy about remarks made about indigenous people and unsure how she's supposed to feel about racial microaggressions, let alone react. But Louise begins to take matters into her own hands, tearing down a school poster featuring a caricature of a Hollywood Indian in a feathered headdress confronting the influential school football captain demanding change. She also writes and publishes a very public editorial in the school's newspaper, directly addressing the violence targeted at cast members of the musical and their families, and the destructive everyday behaviours that fuel racial hate crime. A school musical is a staple of the high school experience, but in selecting The Wizard of Oz, the teacher has also selected L. Frank Barnes, wonderful Wizard of Oz. Baum wrote the children's novel The Wonderful Wizard of Oz in 1900 and multiple sequels, but it is Victor Fleming's 1939 on-screen adaptation that made the lure of fantasy A Voyage Over Rainbows popular and let its creator pass beneath notice. Not in this novel though. Among hateful notes slipped into school lockers and the mailboxes of the cast members' homes, is a short, sharp imperative using the film's most famous line. There is no place like home, 
go back to where you came from. The threats continued to escalate until this is painted as graffiti and red paint on the Wolf family's garage at 3 a.m. on the day of the first performance of the musical, and a brick is thrown through the window. For Louise, who is reporting on the events for the student paper, it's not hard to read between these two lines. It is her brother Huey, cast as the Tin Man, who spells out the problem when tasked with writing the programme that will accompany the musical. He writes, L. Frank Baum is remembered as someone who created a magical world with very different characters coming together as friends. But he was like the wizard. His public image doesn't match the reality of who he was. Baum was a terrible man who hated American Indians and wanted us all killed. Louise asks for more clarification and Huey produces the editorials that L. Frank Baum wrote for a South Dakota newspaper, the Aberdeen Saturday Pioneer. December 20th, 1890. Sitting Bull is dead. With his fall, the mobility of the redskin is extinguished, and what few are left are a pack of whining curs who lick the hand that smites them. The whites, by law of conquest, by justice of civilization, are masters of the American continent, and the best safety of the frontier settlers will be secured by the total annihilation of the few remaining Indians. Why not annihilation? Their glory has fled, their spirit broken, their manhood effaced. Better that they die than live the miserable wretches that they are. January 3rd, 1891. Following the massacre at Wounded Knee, wherein US soldiers brutally murdered upward of 300 Lakota people, men, women, and children. Our only safety depends upon the total extermination of the Indians. Having wronged them for centuries, we had better, in order to protect our civilization, follow it up by one more wrong and wipe these untamed and untamable creatures from the face of the earth. The school musicals director, Mrs. Q, informs Huey that the piece he has written is off tone and off focus because Mom, Mom was simply a man of his time and nobody cares anymore. But Huey cares, as does Smith. Louise finds that L. Frank Barnes words keep cycling through her mind because this is Kansas and odes to Oz are everywhere. Through them, Balm lives on. Louise is as distressed as her brother is, but her closest friend, a white girl, is dismissive. She states, you're upset about something that somebody wrote about something that happened over a hundred years ago in South Dakota. That's not even your Indian tribe, is it? Smith explores how easy it is for white members of the school, staff and students, to align what indigenous students feel, as Smith unpacks how Balm impacts upon Huey and Louise now. It was what had happened at Wounded Knee, what Balm had done to fuel it and validate it, and that a teacher, Huey's theatre teacher, had acted like it wasn't important. Again, Smith uses the character of Louise's mother to foster understanding and break down reflections on Balm, the musical, and Mrs. Q's reaction to Huey's essay. Balm was a monster, but if you break it down, the musical isn't the Oz books, and neither of those are the man himself. Defenders of Balm who don't simply overlook or dismiss the man point to his progressive views on women's rights, support of the suffragette movement, and use of strong female characters in his fiction. But Louise's mother also explains what Smith achieves in this novel. I feel like there's too much wrong in the world to fix, but I'm determined to fight. I feel like shining a spotlight on what certain people try so hard not to see. Hearts Unbroken shines a spotlight on Baum's editorial and calls his legacy into question. There is no single line of didacticism in this novel, though. Smith doesn't push all characters or readers to the same conclusion about these revelations. Huey decides to forfeit his role in the musical because Balm created the Tin Man and that ruined the role for him. But Louise openly admits that she is unsure whether she would have made the same decision and risks seeming not to express solidarity with her Black and Hispanic cast members. Other white characters, notably Mrs. Q, demonstrate room for growth. When Huey quits the musical, Mrs. Q declares it a teachable moment and leads an open discussion about the relationship between artists and their art and their audiences. She admits to the students that at first it had been easy for her to mentally separate Balm's editorials from the Oz musical, 
and that she hadn't wanted to think that hard about it. She decides to extend and publish his piece in the finalized program to afford his readers space to think about supposedly classic American writers. It may be argued that through a teacher character, Smith engages with initiatives around young adult fiction, like Shake Up Your Shelves, which argues that teachers should retire offensive, outdated titles and replace them with contemporary own voice narratives that reflect the experiences of underrepresented groups. Shake Up Your Shelves encourages teachers and librarians to remix their curriculum. They state, with diverse books, teachers and librarians have an opportunity to help young people understand themselves and others. We encourage you to look critically at the books you're sharing with your students and patrons. Debates over racist depictions of minority ethnic groups have been ongoing, but have resurfaced in the wake of what critics have cal dubbed cancel culture. Prominent examples include the withdrawal of six Dr. Seuss books from publication due to their racially insensitive images and the removal of Laura Ingalls Wilder's name from a Lifetime Achievement Award by the American Library Association because of her derogatory portrayal of Native Americans. Epitomized in the lines of In the Little House on the Prairie, published in 1935, Kansas has no people, only Indians. And the only good Indian is a dead one. Smith finds another way in Hearts Unbroken. She does not cancel Balm or retire The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Instead, she creates a novel through which young readers can consider the person that he was outside of his fiction through the views that he held. Young readers and educators have a space to openly discuss and debate Balm, the editorials and their impact within the school context that she depicts, specifically through a young indigenous protagonist. In the way that Smith suggests, all stories are in conversation with one another. In an interview that she gave for a study called Rich in Colour, Reading and Reviewing Diverse Young Adult Books in 2018, she made her position clear. Story is A, how all of us make sense of who we are, and B, how we connect or disconnect with each other. It's also how we go to war. Story may not be everything, but it fuels and shapes everything. In April of this year, she distilled her thoughts into a key question that is clear and concise. Who do we want to hold up to children and teens as a voice that matters? It is in this way that Indigenous young adult literature works in solidarity with cultural activism, holding up the voices that matter and creating a space to openly discuss and debate key issues. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Danny, for this wonderful paper. And it's, uh, yes, it, it was so interesting. And I love the fact that every single panel picked up, you know, this strand of indigeneity. So I think that's really interesting. And maybe we can kind of draw, you know, come back to that later on in the discussion or in the social event later on. But now I'd like to welcome Anandita Pan. And she'll be talking about uh, caste, gender and partition. The Reimagined Self, Il Kalyani Taka Jarad Amikino Jarad Liki. Um, as, as far as I know, this is the first paper on Kalyani Taka Jarad's autobiography, and I think that's really wonderful. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of secretly hoping that the, the translation of, of this autobiography is coming out soon because I'd love to hear it. But as so always, your work on it is sort of the second best. <laughs> I can I can kind of uh, get some information from you about this. So Andy Dapanti is an assistant professor in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences in ISER Bhopal. Her area of research and teaching include gender studies, Dalit studies and intersectionality. And she has published extensively on Dalit feminism and her book Mapping Dalit Feminism was just published by Sage Street in 2020. So congratulations, Ananita, and we're looking forward to your paper. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Anandita Pan and uh, today I'm going to speak on uh, the paper which is titled Caste, Gender and Partition, the Reimagined Self in Ami Kano Chara Likhi. Now my paper is on Bengali Dalit literature and uh, Dalit literature in Bengal actually emerged in the hands of Dalit refugees who migrated to West Bengal, which is the part of Bengal that is included in India from Bangladesh after the partition. 
so uh, this literature actually holds special significance because uh, you know it's unique experience as a dalit refugee so bengali dalit literature challenges the belief that the bengali educated left aligned community is actually unmarked by caste it shows how succinctly actually caste has survived within the so called educated uh, environment in bengal now even as we speak uh, the about the existence of caste system in bengal it is also important to mention that the experience of casteism is not similar uh, between people so the way dalit men experience caste system is quite different from dalit women and it is important to talk about those specificities of caste and gender based oppressions especially standing right now when the concerns over dalit women dalit feminist movements are raging across india so the complexities of caste class religion community al- along with environment are very important right now so that is why it's bengali dalit literature is emerging as one of the uh, very powerful arenas in which the dalit movement is currently flourishing so bengali dalit women's writings can provide a different and new layer of understanding through this kind of what i call an intersectional perspective where we look at caste and gender in an intersectional manner and we can also derive from these writings a kind of counter narrative to the dominant mainstream feminist or even dalit notions that we have regarding caste system and how that happens i will be discussing through uh, kollani thakur charal's autobiography ami keno charal likhi so ami keno charal likhi it was published in 2016 and it literally means why i write charal so the autobiography is rooted in the construction of her identity as a dalit woman refugee so the author kollani thakur charal mentions that after their arrival in west bengal the part in india they faced tremendous caste discrimination and thanks to which they changed their surname to thakur so initially they were just named as kollani charal but later on they added kollani thakur and they removed the charal and they were forced to take this decision because of the social pressure and the expectation to erase the caste based stigma but interestingly a change in surname did not ensure a change in their identity the author says how she experienced caste discrimination in school and even after she got a job so later on as she grew up and grew more conscious about her own identity and how the uh, conscious decision of choosing chadal can challenge the caste based stigma she decided to add chadal to her surname so chadal it's uh, let me just explain what does it mean so chadal is a colloquial form of chandal chandal in bengali and the term refers to a person who cremates dead bodies for a living so this work is specifically given uh, to the untouchable lower caste communities because cremation is always considered a polluted work so we have many other examples like sewage cleaning so all uh, you know uh, cremation of body so all these things have been historically assigned to the dalit people because they are cons- uh, considered untouchable so associated with untouchability this term therefore signifies caste based stigma and uh, kollani thakur charal actually mentions an incident on her first day at an office so she overhears people uh, who are whispering among themselves which caste so to this she loudly replied charal and her sudden bold proclamation actually shocked everyone because they were not used to a dalit openly identifying his or her caste and she considers this proclamation of her dalit identity as agential this sensitivity actually comes from her disillusionment that a change in surname would erase uh, you know the caste identity she realizes that even though she gets education she gets a job but the institutions 
that regulate and promote casteism actually flourish and promote it even further. So Kalani Thakur actually experiences a life that is thrice displaced as a Dalit, as a woman and as a refugee. She mentions in her autobiography how Dalit women refugees bore the brunt of this displacement. It was common among poor Dalit refugees to sell their girl children in exchange of money. And uh, she mentions that her cousin was actually sold off in Delhi uh, in promise of giving work. And uh, at that time, Kalyani didn't know that she was sold. And next day, when the cousin sent a postcard begging the uncle to bring her back, but the uncle actually tore the postcard and angrily retorted that there is no news from the cousin. So uh, now a little bit of background to how the experience of Dalit refugees was different from the non-Dalit refugees uh, in India. It's very important to mention that a little bit in passing so as to properly understand how Dalit women's issues were even more specific to the caste gender-based oppression. So caste segregation among the refugees was very prominent. So when the refugees arrived from Bangladesh to West Bengal, they were given uh, or they were sent off often uh, in certain refugee camps. Now the upper caste, upper class, uh, the so-called Bhadralok refugees actually occupied the well-built well -built colonies in Calcutta because of their connection with the government officials. And also they were wealthy and they belonged to the upper caste. But Dalit refugees were often sent to the Andaman Islands and the Dandakaranya. And the segregation of Dalits uh, in distant rehabilitation camps actually indicated the perpetuation of caste uh, system. So in the camps that they were the, uh, the, the Dalits were sent, they had different toilets which were termed for untouchables. So they could not use all the toilets or all the uh, kitchen facilities. Now, although the Namashudra leaders like uh, Dalit Namashudra leaders like Piyar Thakur, Jogendranath Mandal, they resisted such government rehabilitation center, uh, rehabilitation programs, and they also used their religious and political influence to settle down in Calcutta. Uh, but uh, for the poor Dalit refugees, the situation was very dire. They were often sent to the faraway lands, and even the uh, Dalits, uh, Dalit refugees who, uh, uh, you know, managed to stay in Calcutta, there was a path segregating uh, them between, uh, you know, upper caste refugees and the Dalit refugees. So, uh, as a consequence, we can see how caste system, despite, uh, you know, partition or despite coming from one country to another, caste system continued to pervade even among the refugees. And it was, as I mentioned earlier, the Dalit women who received severe consequences in the form of being sold in exchange of money, being raped. So uh, she, Thakur Channel actually recounts innumerable accounts where um, incidents, including her own sister's gang rape, pregnancy before marriage, pregnancy of widows, severe domestic violence uh, and desertion by husbands. Now, along with, uh, you know, the uh, uh, violence inflicted on uh, Dalit women refugees that were there, uh, another problem that occurs, you know, while talking about caste and gender is the erasure of Dalit women in the academia and in the uh, theoretical sectors. So, uh, Th Kalani Thakur channel actually mentions, uh, you know, one of the categorical erasures that she had faced. So she mentions how a noted film critic uh, who boldly talked about, used to talk about caste in his films, uh, did not even touch the books uh, when he visited her bookstall. Instead, he told her that, uh, you know, she shouldn't, she's trying to erase caste system. She shouldn't do things like that. She should forget about caste and go ahead with her life. Now, Thakur Charal specifically mentions the names of these people in order to highlight the hypocrisy of the Bengali intelligentsia who proclaim, uh, you know, anti-caste sentiments in public, but, uh, you know, are very hypocritical and do not actually practice it in life. So she also points at the proclamation of Bengali feminists that they believe in feminism, 
but not in casteism. So there is a question that uh, Kollani Thakur Charal asked that if educated feminists uh, make such remarks, where would we go? Now, it is very important to go back to why she names them. So as I had mentioned in the uh, beginning of my presentation, that naming is very powerful in the sense that it is through a name or a surname that one's caste identity is uh, you know branded is identified or it's signified so the so when uh, uh, kollani thakur charal takes up the same method of naming people it has another significance so by naming thakur charal reverses the differential treatment she received due to her caste naming and shaming is widely uh, used as a tool by the uh, you know upper caste people to brand and segregate the dalits now when kollani thakur charal uses the same method so the specific use of names actually serves as a mean to means to redirect the criticism towards the upper caste upper class people who pretend to have the progressive image but visibly often practice caste and gender based discrimination now uh, the next point I would like to focus on uh, while talking about, uh, you know, Kollani Thakur Charal's autobiography is the way she constructs the autobiography, the very genre that she deals with. Now, uh, you know, as we know, autobiography actually uh, is or uh, emerges as a kind of narrative of the self or of the individual. The kind of autobiography that uh, Kollani Thakur Charal writes is something that is based on a collective identity and this is where the importance of an alternative autobiography emerges this autobiography actually defies the notion of an individualist self which became so popular with um, the autobiographies written by men now thakur charal's autobiography is strewn with the lives of other dalit women especially her sister her grandmother and her mother and uh, you know, it was a pain which made this bond actually stronger. So Thakur Charal mentions that throughout her life, uh, she has lived as a caregiver for her sister, who was who often suffered from mental illness. But her death left uh, a tremendous emptiness within the author. So what we really see is, uh, you know, the bond is not limited, in fact, in this autobiography only to interpersonal relationships. Uh, in the introduction to the autobiography, she also mentions that this book is a conscious intervention in the dominant Brahmanism and patriarchy. And she promotes a particular intersectional perspective to destabilize the dominant ideologies. So this uh, conscious uh, self believes in solidarity and the I in or the self in Amikano Chara Likhi goes beyond the limited scope of personal is political and it also explores how self representational practices are influenced by history, politics and subjectivity. Now the ending of the book is perhaps uh, the most reassuring and uh, rewarding. Uh, Thakur Charal ends by documenting a workshop uh, organized in Pondicherry in 2012 by the Sparrow Women Archive, uh, which brought together 12 Dalit women writers from six states across India. So this workshop consisted not only of Dalit women writers sharing their writings, uh, it also showcased drama, autobiographical accounts, narratives by Dalit women activists and so on. So this workshop highlighted Dalit women, women's organizational power and the need to build solidarity across regions, cultures and modes of articulation. So the identity that Kollani Thakur Charal creates as a Dalit woman is an affinity based, uh, solidarity based collective identity. So uh, her autobiography shows how envisioning Dalit woman as an intersectional category uh, you know, challenges the single axis formulation of woman and Dalit. So the caste gender intersectional angle actually revises the dominant notion of patriarchy understood only through gender. And it shows that when it comes to casteism uh, affecting women, not all women are affected equally by caste system. Uh, there are specificities 
to, uh, which affect some women more than the others. So upper caste women are not equally affected as Dalit women by caste system. Similarly, when we talk about sexism, it's not that you know Dalit men and Dalit women are equally affected by it. Dalit women's oppression is very much specific to this intersectional lens that is unfortunately often ignored or erased in mainstream feminism or in Dalit politics. So this autobiography therefore highlights the need to understand the interconnection between caste and gender and it also emphasizes uh, on the need to recognize the difference among women and Dalits as two categories. So um, Dalit, uh, you know, Thakur Chanal's autobiography forces us to see that uh, violence inflicted on Dalit women refugees is not merely a result of their sex. It is a structural issue where Dalit women's bodies are made into sites to exercise control over the entire community. So in focalizing um, on citizenship, gender is completely ignored in uh, case of Dalit politics. So that is why writings by Dalit women refugees are even more necessary because they highlight the perpetual silencing of gender in Dalit politics and they also introduce a new intersectional angle in the caste gender theorization through the idea of citizenship. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Anandita, for this you know, wonderful intersectional analysis of Kalini Jara's um, autobiography. Now we're going to have uh, going to a paper that is written was produced by two scholars, but you know, only one of them is presenting it today. So the, the authors are Deba Srita Day, who will present it, and Priyanka Tripathi. And the title of their paper is Reconstructing Widowhood, Collective Identity and Female Agency in Select Indian Literary Narratives. And Deba Srita, who is, who is presenting, is an institute fellow and teaching assistant of English at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences in, the Indian, in sorry, the Indian Institute of Technology in Patna. She's currently working on literary gerontology for a doctoral thesis, and her areas of research interests comprise feminist studies, disability studies, and medical humanities. She has presented research papers in international conferences organized by the University of Guelph, IIT Madras, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Priyanka Tripathi is an Associate Professor of English in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at the IIT Patna. She has published extensively within Indian literature and in several other journals, and she is also uh, the, book, uh, the book reviews editor of the Rukata Journal of Interdisciplinary Studies and Humanities. And currently she is working on an IC, ICSSR funded project entitled Mapping Domestic Violence in the Times of COVID-19, a study from Bihar. She works in the areas of South Asian fiction, gender studies, place and literature, and graphic narratives. So thank you very much both, and Deva Shrita, we're looking forward to your paper. Thank, thank you, you Ma. Hello, everyone. I'll be presenting on Reconstructing Widowhood. Now, widowhood in initially and quite recently referred to as a state of social death. The widow's social and civil death stemmed from her alienation from reproduction and sexuality following the loss of her husband and her exclusion from the functioning social unit of the family. Now, in sharp contrast to the positive images encompassed in the ideal of Pativrata, that is an obedient and loyal wife, uh, like and the glorification of motherhood, Puranic tradition manifests certain other images which appear to be hostile to certain categories of women. Now, what are these certain categories of women? These include widows in particular, as widowhood is inextricably associated with the idea of inauspiciousness in the Manusmriti, which is an ancient legal text and constitution among the many dhar dharma shastras of Hinduism. Now, once the woman ceases to be a wife, especially a childless wife, she ceases to be a person. She was then neither a daughter nor a daughter-in-law. The problem of the widow in the Brahmanical structure of patriarchy was that since the wife had no social existence outside of her husband, 
and her relationship to him was underlined by her role in reproduction than as a widow who or what was she now ideally the chaste woman would cease to exist at the death of her husband by joining her on the funeral pyre but if she did not become a sati she came to be institutionally marginalized while she was physically alive she was socially dead now without an identity separate from marriage the women themselves merged within the background to be identified only in accepted roles such as a wife and mother thus a perceptible form of invisibility is conferred by the society on the hindu widow whose conditional visibility as a wife is lost with the death of her husband deprived of a social identity the widow is expected to exist in a state of alienation and self denial which can be emotionally very wrenching regardless of the woman's age this transition from the marital status is also encoded within a specific framework of bodily and psychosocial ordinances encompassing spiritual thinking like a disengagement from maya that uh, that uh, that comprises the worldly att attachments wearing mainly white clothing abstaining hot spicy and non vegetarian food as it would excite their worldly passions fasting in order to cleanse their body and mind and such others this representations discourses and political contestations surrounding the plight of the upper caste hindu widow remains implicated within the questions of religious salvation family honor and community construction in the indian society now babsi sidwa's water and indira goswami's the blue naked god seeks to explore how the widows remain trapped within the questions of religious salvation family honor and community construction in the indian society Sidwa Babsi's over has been known for its nuanced portrayal of women and minority communities in the subcontinent and the novel water is derived from the script and early edit of Deepa Mehta's film which casts a poignant look at the marginalization of the widows in the Indian society while Mehta was shooting the film in Banaras there was a huge outcry as the movie dealt with the sensitive issue related to the plight of the widows who were nearly leading an ostracized life thus to ensure the film's validation and acceptance babsi was requested to write a novel that would strike at the very roots of the patriarchal structure and help one to question the social con consciousness that has categorically deidentified the widows The novel set in 1938 brings to the surface the intertwined histories of oppression that has deeply impacted the lives of women and has emphatically focused on the notion of consent and cognizance that gets appropriated by the masculine. The 6-year-old's marriage to the 44-year-old man reflects on how a girl from her early childhood days internalizes that her identity as a living entity and her apparent usefulness are only associated with her husband her body is thus transformed into a conflicting side of stree swabhava that is the lustful aspect and stree dharma that is the womanly duty should be tamed and controlled within the parameters sanctioned by marriage the child's untimely widowhood after 2 years invariably seizes her childhood pushing her into the pangs of widowhood on being informed about her husband's death the child's inquisitive mind asks for how long do i have to be a widow father having forgotten about her marriage the ruddy glow on her husband's face while he was burning on the pyre brought back the faint memories of her wedding day as she stood affixed unaware of the radical rupture from wifehood to widowhood At her new refuge, the little girl comes across women like her, young and old alike, with fair, pale faces and clad in white, tonsured head, existing in austerity for eating up their husbands and atoning for their probable sins of the past. Their every movement seemed to be an apology for their continued existence. Their 
the head of the uh, ashram here, Madhumati, uh, tried to pacify the hysterical girl by saying that in our shared grief, we are all sisters here and this ashram is our only refuge. Now, the residents of this widow ashram, be it the little girl or the young woman like Shakuntala and Kalyani, appear in transitory forms of temporary unities and groupings in which individuals' relation with their own bodies and identities are also in a process of constant flux. With their sheer presence turning ominous and their unsteered sexuality emerging as a potential danger to the morality of the society, these widows shared a sense of responsibility and compassion towards each other's familiar agony. Now, be it the embracing motherly protection of Shakuntala towards the little girl or her silent yet assuring stance towards Kalyani's desire of getting remarried, such gestures mark the beginnings of trust in their interpersonal relations. The particular instance when Chuya, the little girl, and the old aunt, we can see this on the third image of the slide, Pattiraji sat companionably close, sharing their experiences. The, sign, uh, the scene strikes audience as well as readers as it encompasses both the individuals, one angular and withered with age and the other in the bloom of robust childhood, looking similar in their innocence as well as their vulnerab vulnerability, they completed a circle, thus reinforcing that the very young and the very old belong together in this punitive code of widowhood. Their existence, despite being reviled and invalidated by their own kin, was however a source of comfort for each other and embroiled in Kalyani's dream, the little widow allows, uh, allows herself to rekindle the hope for a brighter future. Now, the novel also gives us a glimpse of forced prostitution for survival that torments the young widows and Kalyani's victimization in the twin hands of Madhumati and the elite upper class throws a light at the consistent exploitation of the widows whose potential sexuality and presence were otherwise termed as dangerous or even polluting to the society. Now, Shakuntala's role in releasing Kalyani from her literal as well as her metaphorical confinement remains significant here as she dared to defy Madhumati and even the tradition of the ashram, which consequently transformed the fear in Kalyani's eye into a glimmer of hope. Now, Shakuntala's uh, strong, unwavering, and confident, inspiring face stirred Kalyani's courage as she walked out from the dark room into the light, hinting at the mutual trust and respect that they nurtured for each other. Such an alliance towards their individual struggle for a common goal. And what is this common goal? To question injustice, oppression, and the social vulnerability that plagued their lives. And despite their dissent differing in their intensities, it did enable to evoke solidarity in a new light that vehemently opposed the forced invisibility and conformity on them. Thus, this collective sense of misery and societal enslavement evoked a sense of sympathy where the organic nature of solidarity created a functional interdependence that aided in easing their pain, a stinging pain that was oblivious to the society because of the widow's half-dead status. But according to the innocent logic of the little girl, she was undeniably half alive. Now, how unquestioned beliefs uh, centering around Hindu notions of purity and ideal womanhood systematically perpetuates and perpetrates female oppression finds an evocative representation in Indira Raisom Goswami's writings. Her autobiography, Adha Lekha Dastavej, or an unfinished autobiography, probes the underlying foundation of injustice that has imposed itself on this vulnerable other in the name of religion, culture, and caste. Being an early widow herself, Goswami traveled to Brindavan to explore the shadowed lives of the widow living in the holy city, which eventually turned out to be a cathartic experience for her. Her semi-autobiographical novel, The Blue Naked God, or Neel Kanta Braja, remains a compelling testimony of the wide-ranging rep uh, repressive customs and practices she encountered there. While uh, the term journey is often associated with the notion of space expressed through uh, spatial or temporal configurations, here it is expressed as the journeys of the identity. 
The novel chronicles the social and psychological displacement of Sodamini, a young 20-year-old widow who arrives at Braj to cleanse her mind of the memory of her forbidden Christian lover and engage herself in spiritual duties to pacify her tormented heart. Alongside, the book also narrates about the incapacitated lives of the widows, other widows, I mean, uh, seeking refuge in the city of Braj. And Braj is the land of Lord Krishna located at the uh, center of Mathura and Vrindavan in Uttar Pradesh, India. The widows of this region are known as Radhe Shamis because they sing devotional songs praising Krishna, Radhe, and earn a pittance to fend for themselves. Now, a parallel picture that arises in both the novels besides the pitiable condition of the widows is we see that the meager amount that these widows earn is kept aside for their cremation rather than to you know, uh, feed their hungry stomachs. Fearing that they would be deprived of the last rites on their deathbed, uh, these widows frantically hold on to their little savings even at the cost of their consuming hunger. The sheer poverty-clad lives of these powerless beings amidst the religious aura of the Braj disconnect Sodamini even more because here where in this land where people come to seek salvation, what she saw was worse than terror. Now, Hannah Aran talks about the spectacle of misery which may not necessarily evoke pity and in this context we realize that the moral blindness and dogmatism of patriarchy towards these unfortunate widows creates a gulf that prevents the class of those who do not suffer from forming an idea of the suffering of the unfortunate. This scene emerges when during the Annakut festival Priests offer, I quote, huge mountains of food to the Lord, but deprive the starving widows who collectively hold on to their superstitious faith that a mere glimpse of this festival could avert their pangs of hunger for the entire year. Thus, in their famished eyes were buried the untold truths of despair, destitution and dehumanization. We come across another young widow, Sashi Prova, who lived with a priest named Alam Garhi and helped him with the temple duties. Now, this was a very common sight in Braj because many priests kept destitute widows in their rooms and both parties benefited by this agreement, which reflects on the, uh, like the sexual as well as the emotional exploitation that, th that these widows have to bear for the, a hassle-free living. However, Alangari's company was considered harmless for Sashi Prova here because he was a eunuch and she claims to Mrinalini, who is another character in the novel, a 40-year-old unmarried woman, that Alangari has not harmed or spoiled me in any way. Now, Mrinalini's state of extreme helplessness with her old fragile parents makes her feel like a beast of burden and she immediately connects with Sashi Prova's remarks and I quote, Women who have no one in the wide world to call their own, women who live in constant fear of their bleak futures, have no other way. Unquote. The religio-cultural pronouncements of the society becomes a bar in between Sodamini's new life and old memories, and she uh, and old memories, and she openly discusses like her physical feelings uh, with another physical feelings and also her mental emotions with another Radhishami. And she asks, did you also face a situation similar to mine? And what about your physical hunger? What did you do to save yourself from the terrible torment of loneliness? Thus, what emerges from the sense of familiar powerlessness and common difference is deeper solidarity that hints towards complication, mutuality and common interests as it requires knowledge and understanding of the specific and different histories and experiences of women living in Braj. The questions posed by Sodamini makes one wonder what are these widows collectively appealing for to a set of feelings, to a uh, like a shared values or, or histories of mutual vulnerability, to isolation, denigration or neglect, or to the common need for recognition. Now, the sacred land of Braj here thus emerges as a space that allows the author to explore and articulate the differences while providing inclusive understanding of the we feeling or affectional solidarities that serve as an integrating force for the marginalized sections of the society. Now, empathy can be understood as a moral sentiment characterized by particular modes of 
reason and impulse for justice and the capacity to empathize with others suffering and the urge to act upon it is our animal heritage and morally valuable in itself now empathy can be seen as both an avenue or a window to others experience and as an emotion that can generate solidarity alliances and trust and can also engender social change and women's collective empowerment now in this sense the effective drive is rooted within lived experiences and the procured knowledge that arises from the pluralistic friendships pave the path for social movements and productive politics now it is you know like the solidarity the concept of solidarity is rooted in the realization that each person must take responsibility for the other because as consociates all must have an uh, interest in the integrity of their shared life and we are interested in the same way not simply because of our mutual interdependence though it is definitely important but also because each of us wants to be acknowledged as an individual with unique perspectives and contributions which give shape to the collectivities of which we are a part thus the reflective notion of solidarity which emerges in bapsi and goswami's individual works makes one aware of the evident reality behind the abandonment of the widows and i quote one less mouth to feed four saris one bed to let somewhere a corner saved for another widow there is no other good reason disguised as religion is just about money thus the inclusive understanding of we whereby the strength of the bond connecting the widows strength stems from their mutual recognition of each other enables shakuntala to strive for an alternative secure reality for the little 8 year old and reflects on the great determination born of necessity that enabled the radhe shamis to strengthen the ties connecting all of them to let others know that they are neither forgotten nor alone Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Vibash Peter. Um, for a moment, we also saw Priyanka there, <laughs> but she's she's gone again. Oh, so thank you very much. We're looking forward to kind of talking about this in more detail later. But for now, please uh, let's kind of welcome Abul Frushan, who's going to be presenting a paper on behalf of himself and Ali Abdul Rezai, and the um, the title of their paper is Deconstructing Consent. A hyper-realist form of cultural activism and Iran, and it's uh, it's it's probably our most um, expansive paper. So I'm very much looking forward to it. But briefly, in terms of introduction, Abul Frushan is the Iran editor of Poetry International Web and has been the chair of Exile Writers Inc. UK. Two selections of Abul's poetry have been published: one, A Language Against a Language, uh, in 2008. And then a bilingual volume, I Need Your Desert for My Sneeze, in Persian and English in 2009 by Poetry Pub. And Abdul, Ali Abdul Rezai is an Iranian British prolific poet, writer, literary theorist, and political analyst with over 70 books to his name. Before leaving Iran in 2001, he was known as one of the most innovative poets of the contemporary Persian literature and Persian literature and poetry. And he's also the leader of the Iranakis party, a movement in Iran fighting against the Islamic Republic. And Abdul Rezai is also known by Muta, the wise teacher in old Persian. Thank you very much. Abul, I hope I haven't mangled that last Persian word <laughs> too much. Um, not at all. Um, the, um, I'm just trying to make sure I share my screen. Is that coming through? Excellent. OK, well, thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, present to you a um, uh, a fast moving progression of a movement that um, uh, combines militancy and solidarity in the context of Iran. It um, its roots uh, goes back to 2016 when it started as a grassroots literary movement in poetry and fiction. By 2018, the movement pivoted from a um, literary to a political cool movement, movement, especially uh, following the um, nationwide uprising of uh, December 2018. 
this material was actually presented and uh, it was discussed in um, some of the other previous paper at the uh, Postcolonial Conference 2018. Uh, what we've seen since, especially since the December of 2019, when there was another second wave of protests and uprising, the party, uh, the so-called Indian Anarchist Party, has been banned. Its activists have endured imprisonment, torture, rape, and execution. And of course, as as the repression has deepened, the movement has been on a deeper history, which faced um, um, effectively shielding its casualties with undying alternative narratives. So the latest phase. Is that's on in, in this in this paper is really about um, the effort to develop colonialism or political Islam as a form of colonialism in Iran and to be able to re reimagine a kind of post-Islamic culture. So we're really looking at, in this paper at the alternative narratives on the workings of political Islam in, in, in Iranian history. So political Islam is cast as a form of cultural colonialism. Now, what is the you know, historical justification, historical evidence of it? Um, if we were to uh, define cultural colonialism as a form of misappropriation of uh, an indigenous culture and turning it against, uh, turning the narratives and the ritual against the subjects, then we can see that um, in the case of Islamic domination of Iranian culture for the last 1400 um, years. We've seen, for instance, the replacement of joyful rituals into rituals of mourning and emotional engagement. So for instance, in the times in the Zoroastrian tradition, you had a, a, a day of celebration each month. What we have under, um, since the Islamic, especially the Shiite version, we have the 12 imams, 12 imams that have uh, have to be mourned in the, they've all been martyred and they will all act of mourning, which basically puts in place as a, a culture of sorrow uh, dominated by fear and emotional engagements that perpetuates the, the way in which the current system works. Um, what, what we um, also can see in the context of the last hundred years or so, we can see that political Islam has been in various ways diverted and defeated democratic movements that um, occurred in the constitutional revolution in 1905, then in the, uh, during the Mossadegh era in, two, in 1952, ending in the coup, and in the revolution of 1979, which led to the Islamic Republic. But, but basically, the Islamic Republic in this context can be seen as a culmination of a series of clerical maneuvers over the last century that started with, for instance, uh, it, it involved different dimensions, protecting the endowments of the church and of, of the mosque in the in the sort of 60, 1964 uprising of um, Khomeini's followers that led to his exile in uh, reforms of the regime, or the monarchy as a proxy to clerical rule when the uh, Reza Khan, who uniting Iran, was told that he should be, this nation is always a king, so he became the Reza Shah inaugurating the Pahlavi dynasty, which then um, exercise, you know, delivered, developed uh, the country through modernization uh, that in various ways was um, countered by the, um, by the Shiite Islam, uh, by the clerics. Um, all the way from the Constitutional Revolution of 1905 to the Pahlavis and so forth. Ultimately, to be able to sort of hand over some form of absolute power to a, to a supreme leadership, which was basically started with Ayatollah Khomeini and his successor now. The dynamic of this is basically tending back towards a kind of um, the tension between the Republic and the Islamic nature of it is, is one of the interesting areas of discussion, especially given that today we have a, an important presidential elections going on in the country. So there is, there is justification to saying that there is a form of colo cultural colonialism going on here. Now, how does this movement deal with this? Well, there are effectively 
uh, this is back uh, uh, looking back at the at the the history of this movement in the last two three years, and we can see um, that Iranarchist approach is really to take a, a kind of post-colonial perspective to be able to reimagine a post-Islamic regime in Iran, and and it starts with. It started with debunking the, the, some of the Islamic narratives, some of the custom and practices by uh, using um, linguistic techniques that we discussed in the previous paper uh, in 2018 um, and from free verse to free Iran, as it was called. And, and it also they, they have been using uh, having its origins in literature and poetry. It has actually been deploying n new forms of protest and street action through the use of language and linguistic tropes that uh, including, you know, not only just graffiti, but the types of slogans that have been introduced since the uh, 2018 and 19 in the in the protest movements. Um, and this was discussed something that something I discussed in a in a an article in Poetry International um, called Poetry versus the Body Politic. So the the, the argument that um, that the um, Iranarchists put forward is the fact that Islam is creating a kind of hyper-reality. So what do we mean by hyper-reality? We mean it's basically like Baudrillard explains it. He, it is an inability of consciousness to be able to distinguish reality from a simulation of reality, especially in the context of technology um, and, and say, the social media. What, what political Islam is doing is creating a kind of hyper-realities through introducing some, what you might call a signifiers without an original reference. So Islamic Republic or Islamic democracy or Islamic feminism have been introduced as notions which are in fact these contradictions in terms. What, what we mean by that is, what they mean by that is, you know, democracy or, or the republic refers to the rule of public, whereas Islam believes in the rule of Allah and the Ayatollahs and people that, that basically people uh, should follow. You know, you have the so-called marjaya tarlid, which means the people imitate an ayatollah. Again, with Islamic feminism, feminism is about gender equality and Islam's views on women um, status is well known. Um, there is, you know, they can only inherit half the half a half half a man, or, or they can. Um, um, need two witnesses to to to, to equal a man, etc. So, but but apart from these points of debunking on, on on topics like what do we you know what do you what do you mean by Islamic feminism? What is this hyper reality you're creating? The the deeper question is how can we fully kind of reappropriate one's culture? If taking a post colonial approach, how can we redefine? cultural imaginary of a post-colonial nation, if you like. The approach here that the, the, the movement has, has, has adopted is a form of an, an approach to decolonizing the culture through building on the resilience that has been going on for millennia. Now, we know that cultural colonialism can endure much longer than economic colonialism, but Ira Iranians have had a proven to have a resilient identity that the movement is trying to, is basically building on. So, you know, despite the fact that Iran was defeated by the Ar at the hand of the Arabs and the Mughals, it never was a, a colony of a direct colony of any other nation. But, but the resilience um, has, has been carried through the, the Persian language, the rituals, the rich literature, um, historic contributions. Um, uh, so, you know, Ferdowsi, for instance, is a uh, thousand years ago, Re revived Persian language by and avoid and prevented it from dissolution and and conveyed it through the Shahnameh, which is an epic of kings, and that epic carries a lot of the myth uh, forward. And, um, you know, if you compare Egypt um, to Persia and equally uh, ancient civilization, they lost their language and they were fully Arabized, but this didn't happen in the case of Iran. So what what we're talking about is basically um, the, the this this new the latest movement the, the latest uh, development in the in the forms of resistance is is or, or um, offensive if you like is the alternative narratives that deconstruct the Islamic ones and um, and look at parallels between 
the Persian history and myths and, and, and the Abrahamic ones, for instance, and, and this way create a new imaginary. So, for instance, if you think about the Shahnameh, it talks about the story of Siavash, um, which, which actually um, very much preceded, uh, as a myth, it preceded the Abrahamic myth, but Siavash is very much a figure that was effectively repeated in the story of Abraham. So here are some of the sort of narratives from um, from Muta um, um, through the un untranslated books that have been published in the last two, three years. And I would just sort of summarize them uh, in order to show the kind of the kind of work this involves. So in the first narrative or old, old narrative, I'd like to call it is is, is basically the fact that Zoroastrianism, which uh, ancient Persian religion, influenced Judaism and Shi Shiite Islam. And, and the story goes back to Cyrus the Great, who liberated the Jews from Babylon, and they were banned from um, worship for 80 years. And, and they were, you know, this, this incident is actually captured in, in, in the book of Esther. Um, the Jews were able to go back to um, Jerusalem and uh, and and was sponsored to recreate the Torah, which was very much, according to the story, heavily influenced by Zoroastrianism. Uh, Judaism is in turn very much a strong influence on Islam, if you, uh, especially through G Shiism, uh, more of a Zoroastrian nature of, of this comes through. Um, the fact that Zoroastrianism was a dualistic culture, a dualistic um, uh, religion. It introduced good and evil. There's the, the 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 principle of the god of light, and there's the god of darkness, and this really appears reappears in the form of the the deity and the shaitan and the satan and so forth. Um, so the, basically, you can see that Judaic culture is argued to be heavily influenced by Zoroastrian tradition. Uh, alternative narrative to Christianity itself recycled Mithraism. So Mithraism basically originated in Persia and, and, and very much dominated and infils in, in, infiltrated the Roman legions. So the, throughout the Roman Empire, you had Mithraeums that were the temples, the Mithraic temples, that even a um, Mith Mithraeum was discovered in London in 1945, and you can go and visit it um, in the city. The, 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 the argument that the story of Jesus is very much um, modeled on the story of M Mitra or Meh, who was born on the 25th of December, no later, no sooner, uh, according to the records. And then he was basically um, followed the same kind of Mithraic principles of loving, of love and forgiveness and, and um, turn the other cheek. So Christianity, uh, in its spread, basically adopted Mithraic rituals. So, for instance, uh, accompaniment of prayer with wine or with music was very much a Mithraic tradition. So that um, you basically could sort of, the argument here, that this narrative basically says that Mithraism and Zoroastrianism both kind of originated in Iran and permeated the Judeo-Christian tradition and shaped a lot of the Western culture. Whereas, in the meantime, Iran was, you know, the, or the old Persian Empire was defeated by basically a an Islamic conquest that was very much a um, a Roman strategy. So this is narrative num old narrative number three. So you basically have a scenario with the scenario, the Sassanids, the last uh, Persian Empire versus the Roman Empire. They had an extended border from Armenia through to south, uh, north and Syria in the south. Romans typically were defeated in Armenia, but in barbarian tribes of Arabia. And the Arabian tribes, united under Islam, acted as a kind of the Roman military power in Syria and helped defeat the Persians. Now, this influence, this Roman influence, actually went through the uh, through to Islam through uh, the workings of the character of Salman Farsi or Salman the Persian. So again, the part of this narrative, this alternative narrative, is the fact that Salman Farsi was a Zoroastrian who turned uh, Christian, lived in Medina, and according to the Islamic narrative, became the first Persian who took to Islam and helped Muslim forces win victory over Persia. But what what this narrative 
uh, argues that Salman was actually a teacher of Muhammad and acts as he acted as his military strategist. So, for instance, he um, helped uh, protect Medina through by building a, a moat around it. And even the word Muslim, which in Arabic is Musalman, actually means like Salman. Alt narrative number four. But the Arab strategy at the time and so forth have been an, a strategy of inspiring fear. So this is a strategy of psychological warfare under the sort of motto Al Nasr al Bel Rob, which is victory is in the, is in fear. This was the motto that they confronted Egypt and Persia with. Um, in the Quran, for instance, in the al nasr Surah, there is um, the exhortation of believers to fight and kill in the path of Allah, and they would be victorious over those who follow Satan or, or, or Kafars. Um, if the believers are killed, they would be promised martyrdom and, and a place in um, a salvation in paradise. The imagery of paradise were imitate the Imagery, the, the legendary gardens of Pasargade, which was the Persian um, capital during the Archimedes. Um, the vanquished would, who didn't submit were killed and as infidels, and those who were uh, submitted to Islam, they were taken as, as possessions, as mawali, as, and uh, they were referred to as kanis for, the, for women um, and kolam for men, and these were basically terms referring to servants who basically not only did menial tasks, but were giving sexual favors. The narrative therefore kind of stigmatizes the kind of cultural pride that people in Iran can take for being of an Islamic lineage, having a family identity, uh, considered as descendants of the Prophet and the, carry the title of Sayyid in their, um, um, in their name. This, this piece is really uh, attacking that aspect. So what we are, um, well, this, the story about hyperreality as a bridge to history and, 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 and today's kind of stark reality is, is really something that stands in contrast. You know, the alternative narratives is kind of counter, serve as a counterpoint to, to today's reality, which is a party that is banned and activists are, as I meant, as, um, are sort of languishing under torture and, uh, and repression has escalated since December 2019. And the escalation, arguably, um, is associated with this building on the deeper history and the alternative narratives, which cannot by themselves be easily erased as they gain currency. Um, and they cannot be as easily erased as as the casualties of this movement. So this is itself an interesting question for post-colonial studies to, to you know, the correspondence between the, the stakes of high stakes of, of repression versus high stakes of, of narrative. Today happens to be the day of Iranian presidential election. Um, the alternative discourse that this involves has mobilized a lot of the disaffected youth and others in a kind of movement against participating in the election. Um, you know, argue, they argue that the defeat of the Green Movement in 2009 proved that the voters don't decide the presidency, but basically the vote counters do, and that the judiciary effectively selects compliant candidates and eliminates others. And, and this, this sort of drama is, is, is un, unfolding today. So really, a paper is a sort of a form of dialogue between academic analysis and a kind of what you might call as a literary movement with its own imaginary world that sort of morphed into a new expression of narratives that inform today's reality and experience. So I have to say. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Abul. That was just a, a proper tour de force. <laughs> well done <laughs> for managing it, to do it in, in that amount of time. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating. So we have around 10 minutes uh, for questions because we need to kind of, you know, stick to the time as much as, as possible. So just to give Abul a break <laughs> for, for a moment, we'll uh, start with the questions that we have in the chat. And just let me read those to you. So um, a lot of them are just praise, you know, which is always you know, very nice. 
And Valentina, one of the presenters earlier, um, said, um, thank you, Danny, for a brilliant presentation. In it, you discuss at length the brilliant content of the novel and the ways in which he questions a canonical author and his work, inviting critical thinking. It was wonderful if you could talk a little about the form of the novel. Would you say that this novel is resistant in its form? And if so, how? And if we could just connect that to Stephanie Palmer's uh, question. Thanks, Danny. Can you say something more about the significance of being an urban or rather a suburban native? And does this identity, this identity of the author, have any bearing on the novel? So could you ask those questions, answer those questions together? Um, thank you both for the questions. That's really love you. And thank you everybody else for the talks. I've really enjoyed them. Um, starting with Valentina's question. I think the young adult genre is resistant through its dynamic relationships with characters, institutions and social power. So the young adult protagonist through their narrative learns to negotiate social power and its levels as they exist in social institutions such as school, government, church. This relationship, the relationship between the protagonist and the institution, which is established in the young adult genre, shapes them to interrogate and problematize social constructions of authority, power and repression. So I think it's quite resistant in its potential in that relationship. And Stephanie's question, as a suburban protagonist, um, Louise frequently finds that her native identity is dismissed or is seen as not authentically native, partly through her like complexion and partly through this suburban identity because she doesn't reside on a reservation as people would expect her to. Um, Some of the events are influenced by Smith's life directly, such there is a relationship in the novel that's influenced by that. But I also think Louise's identity is informed by her own work, working to tell diverse stories. And she works with many activist groups in that sense to help with representation. So I think she wanted to give a voice to a young indigenous contemporary female without it being the typical narrative. Mm. I think that answered them. Oh, thank you very much. Excellent. Lovely. Thank you so much, Danny. Thank you. And then we have oh, Tom. Tom uh, Lockwood Moran says, great paper so far, excellent and insightful scholarship and sort of um, <laughs> spelled out clapping. Thank you. <laughs> and Pragya Sharma, an earlier presenter, um, says, so in fact, as it is, this is more a comment about Anita's paper but I have a feeling there is a question in there too at the moment and in detail we can't actually see you but I don't know of hope you know you can that you can hear us and that you can answer the question. The Pragya's comment was so insightful Anita and great points highlighted how the oppression faced is never the same for different genders and even within the same gender And I'm wondering whether there is, oh hi, there you are, lovely. I wonder whether there is a bit more of a question on intersectionality, because this is also your field of study. Can you say a bit more about this intersectional approach? Because on, on the surface, it always looks quite straightforward, but in practice, it's not always easy to pull it off, isn't it? I think you've you've already um, shown that quite you know, very well in your um, in your paper, but do you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, so basically, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Pragya, and thank you, Nicole. So, uh, you know, as we have seen, the very uh, crux of Dalit feminist, uh, you know, epistemology is the idea of intersectionality. And it's rooted in the concept of difference. Uh, you know, one of the ways in which we can understand this difference is, uh, you know, how patriarchy, uh, when we redefine patriarchy as a casteist patriarchy, and which is termed as Brahminical patriarchy, how uh, the Brahminical patriarchy creates separate rules for different women of different castes. So upper caste women have one set of rules where they are supposed to stay within the house, uh, veil, you wear veils and all. Uh, whereas uh, when it comes to uh, Dalit women, uh, the same patriarchy prescribes different rules in terms of sexual accessibility uh, because they go out uh, for work 
so they are you know considered sexually accessible so uh, the reason we really need intersectionality is because we really need to uh, recognize that the situation for these different kinds of women uh, is not the same so a patriarchy really needs to be revisited and revised as brahmanical patriarchy and take into consideration the multiple axes of oppression along with gender. Yes, well, excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. And just let me go through the questions that we have in the chat. So there's one, another one from Valentina. Hi, Devashita. You closed your presentation with a note on empathy and solidarity. Do you think that there might be an issue with a solid, with a solidarity defined through empathy. Excellent yes. Uh, <laughs> now the thing is that uh, you know, like these works highlight what I feel is the importance of recognizing the value of others and feeling for others as a way of transforming ourselves, and also it includes an openness to others experience because the way solidarity may be weaved together within a group of differences uh, also follows from striving to appreciate the other as a subject rather than as, than as an object of inquiry so it is about bearing witness also listening and uh, of course not rushing to resolve problems before understanding them but the question remains that it is very attractive to think that we can solve problems by listening to others. But uh, it reminds me of what Judith Butler had said that, um, you know, the, the difficulty of recognition, like we in these two novels uh, that I had taken up in the presentation, we see that the compassion, the empathy remains. But how far are these widows getting recognized in the society? So therefore, we should accept the limits of what we can know, while at the same time, I feel that remain open and learn from others. Because uh, solidarity also, like, it makes us think whether in this particular context, when widowhood is coming into question, like, is it providing space for common differences or do they foster politics of exclusionary solidarity? So they are essential, like, these are also def definitely essential questions on solidarity that operate on you know levels both social and politics and often move from local to global context so they are central to our understanding uh, and uh, like what you know weaves this solidarity and the relation between universal and particular and similarly the similarity and the difference like who can uh, speak for the society and be a part of we and who can't whether we recognize society as like a, a diverse unit and whether it is possible to dig disagree um, like and yet still generate a sense of solidarity. So I hope I have made sense with that. Oh, thank you. No, excellent. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, then there is one more uh, question by Valentina. That one might be lulled into, or maybe that was a continuation, that one might be lulled into a satisfying sense of having suffered alongside these widows, yes, and leave it at that. And how does that empathy create action or what are the obstacles? Uh, to this in your opinion. In many ways, you have actually answered that, haven't you? <laughs> you managed to read it all. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Excellent. Um, yes, and she also thanks us for um, all the presentations. Wonderful. So, Abul, um, what, you know, your, your um, talk has kind of has such a, a massive scope. I'm wondering, are you optimistic that, you know, these, uh, these other narratives, that they are sort of, I mean, they're certainly deeply rooted, yeah, incredibly deeply rooted, the way you presented them, yeah, and I think that is always a strength, and they're also rooted, you know, in Zoroastrianism and in the language, um, but, they, you know, the colonial forces, the way you describe them, seem to be quite solidly in place, don't they? So how how optimistic are you that, that we'll see change? Um, I, I think that, um, you know, it, the... Um, I think it is these are, these narratives are much more foundational work than than daily activism that actually goes on in the streets, if you like. That 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 the, that the um, like the raves of protest that have actually swept across the country uh, spontaneously, variously, um, they they can be quelled and stopped. And of course, machinery of censorship is there for. Um, 
publication of some of these books and material to be prevented from access, but it's it's actually the kind of thing that um, goes beyond the the day to day kinds of struggles, right? So from that point of view, it can serve as a foundation, and it variously speaks to people who are not necessarily um, engaged in the movement um, on a in an active basis, right? So it, it can it can actually create that new consensus. So the, the the kind of argument they're basically putting forward is the fact that you know if you if you do not work with the consciousness and the culture, then you will any change will revert back to the the, the old patterns um, of hierarchical rule that would effectively defeat the purpose of a of a movement, if you like. So it's going towards a much more fundamental work now. The extent to which that will will bring time time will tell. It's difficult to tell. Um, politics has got a very um, um, deceptive facade sometimes. Oh, yeah, absolutely right. Well, thank you, thank you so much, Abul, for that for that comment, and then of course, and for that summary. And in some ways, that it really touches on everything that we have discussed today, yeah, and all the different papers, yeah. And well, thank you so much. Um, we'll bringing this to a close. So thank you to the public for watching. And uh, as panelists, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing you in about half an hour for an informal, you know, chat, unfortunately, without a buffet, uh, unless you provide it <laughs> yourself. And um, please don't forget that uh, tonight at seven o'clock, we have another really exciting event um, with the uh, Dalit rapper, Sumit Samos, and I uh, hope you don't miss that. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again tomorrow for a few more events. So, well, thank you very much, all of you. Yes, uh, a clap, sort of representative of everyone who's here. <laughs> thank you all. All papers today were fantastic, and thank you. What a wonderful panel as well. Take care. <laughs> See yeah. you soon. Bye-bye.